So, uh, yeah, I'd like to uh, thank everybody for attending tonight. Uh, I had some friends from uh, social media X and others. So uh, before I get started, I want to let everybody know that I put a, a lot of links in the chat. Uh, one uh, that's particularly important is a, a link to the talk I'm giving on Wednesday, the uh, political economy of climate change. It's going to be at 8 p.m. Uh, it's a little bit different than normal. The other ones are um, links to material that I'm going to be covering tonight. So um, you're free to to capture all those before we get started. So uh, I wanted to start with uh, this title slide, the Henry George and the money question. Uh, we're doing this on February 19th, 2024. This was originally intended to be the, the last lecture in a series of uh, 10 uh, on Henry George's last book that he wrote, The Science of Political Economy. Uh, and I decided to um, offer this uh, by itself. Uh, when, when I will teach that uh, uh, nine uh, class course on the science of political economy, I guess that's going to be scheduled and maybe Ibrahima can address that uh, at the end of this lecture. So let me uh, start out by uh, giving everybody a, a summary of what was in a recent New York Times article by Connor Doherty. Uh, the title of his, uh, um, his article was, The Georgists Are Out There and They Want to Tax Your Land. And then the subtitle was, Amid a Crisis, in affordable housing, the century-old idea of Henry George have gained a new currency. So this is a uh, an interesting, uh, a, well, uh, on the one hand, it, it seems as though it's an attack, but then you think about it and he's giving a currency to uh, our ideas. And I, I guess what I'd like to say uh, is that what I'm doing tonight and what uh, uh, Ed Dodson has done over the the years is uh, show the otherwise you know that Henry George is gaining a new currency. But uh, look at some of the things that Connor is uh, attacking us with: tinfoil hat wares of economics. Georgism is unrealistic, a relic, a movement of old men. Single tax value is bizarre. Uh, Georges have descended into a wormhole. Georgism is a nerdier version of QAnon. So uh, sticks and stones, uh, I guess I would have to say about that. But he did give us a, an opportunity to, to shine and hopefully tonight will uh, show some evidence that there's a lot of life in the Georgist movement. So I'd, I'd like to thank Connor for all the attention. So getting right into the, the talk tonight, um, you know, back when I was young, uh, life was so innocent. Uh, it was often that we would have Kool-Aid stands selling the uh, concoction of water, sugar, and lemon juice for pennies, which today we would have to charge dollars. So when we ran out of lemons, we'd ask mommy for more and say, please, but uh, there's millions of people who have bought into this concept uh, pushed by uh, Senator Graham back in the 80s. As a Senator Graham often called reductions in taxes, uh, he often called for reductions in taxes and government spending. He called it the Dickey Flat tax uh, test. He said, is it worth taking it out uh, of Dickey's pocket uh, to, to determine if federal programs were worthwhile? Uh, Richard Dickey Flat owned a family-run printing business, a long-term Graham supporter. In other words, the U.S. government is nothing more than a fancy lemonade stand. So why do I say that? Uh, under Graham's uh, way of governing, the U.S. government has to sell treasury notes in order to get the money to continue selling lemonade or whatever it is that the 
US government does. Deficits that are made worse with uh, the notes interest must be paid by raising Dickey Flats taxes. And as of December, 2023, the costs are $288 billion uh, a year to maintain the debt, which is 18% of the federal spending in FY24. So good question is uh, debt to whom? Uh, and I, I guess the little image there is we've always done it that way. So uh, if we've always done it a certain way, there must be some reason or some truth to it. But uh, what they don't teach you in, in college or high school, for that matter, uh, sovereign nations run deficits. They're supposed to. There's no need to search for money. It's when the, within the nation's power to issue currency for any service or physical need. Selling treasury notes is totally unnecessary. There's no need for mommies with money. Graham's thinking is why the Union beat Texas and the other Confederate states 159 years ago. Lincoln had greenbacks, fiat money, printed to facilitate commerce uh, to buy war materiel, thereby boosting the economy during times of extraordinary need. Because Graham wanted to avoid deficit spending, public services were threatened for elimination things we need because we can't afford them. But when it comes to war, cost is no object. So why is that? They always say that. Uh, there's an irony in what I just presented here because uh, an early banking reform that we're gonna be talking about tonight, uh, the 1933 Banking Act was also known as Glass-Steagall is passed in uh, the early days of the New Deal, June 16, 33. It was co-authored by a guy named Senator Carter Glass. You see an image him up here, here. A key provision was the separation of commercial banking from investment banking. Uh, commercial banking involves originating loans to businesses, government, and the large institutions, such as colleges and universities. Uh, and here's... Um, uh, it's uh, Stiegel. The investment uh, banking involves being an intermediary between corporations and financial markets. They arrange debt financing to find investors for corporate bonds. Practice uh, involves insurance companies, hedge fund, uh, private equity. So prior to the crash, bankers would use people's deposits for investment banking with shaky underwriting requirements. So on um, November 12th, 99, this separation of banking operation was repealed in a bill that was co-authored by Graham. And two years later, we had the Enron collapse. And nine years later, we had the Lehman Brothers collapse, both having financial and, and banking uh, aspects to their uh, demise. So, that was a, a little introduction to what I'm going to be talking about. And before I get into this, uh, I wanted to say that uh, every seven or eight slides, I am going to take a break to make sure that everybody's uh, on board or if they have any questions. So let's get right into the, to the material. What I'm going to be talking about tonight is the fact that uh, in 2001, Stephen Zarlenga uh, of the modern uh, American Monetary Institute wrote a 44 page paper on Henry George's concept of money uh, in collaboration with nine other notable Georgists, which I listed here. Although the paper included many useful insights on George's, uh, George's thoughts, uh, um, this presentation tonight is just about money. He claims that George had advanced monetary awareness, and I think you'll see from extensive quotes in uh, uh, George's writings, you'll see this. Uh, Henry, uh, George says that it's the business of government to issue money. And this is a, a key thing that I'm gonna be stressing tonight. Uh, however, with private banks involved in federal banking, we see these private holders of a large part of the public debt enjoying the principal while they draw 
the interest. And that's a, a, a point that Henry George keeps uh, mentioning. So let's start off with um, uh, the fact that you can download this paper and I, I put it in the, the chat so uh, you can grab that anytime. So Dar Zarlenga is rough on George saying that the writing of you know his last book, The Science of Political Economy, killed him, uh, killed George. George was 58 uh, at his 1897 death. Uh, six years earlier, he, he began writing that book. Uh, Zarlinga says that George became a victim of trying to make sense out of economics, as were Smith and Mill and Schopenhauer. When warned that another run for the New York City mayor would kill him, he said, wouldn't it be glorious to die that way? Interesting. Zarlinga says that the science and political economy wasn't as groundbreaking as uh, progress and poverty. Uh, I, I disagree with this, and I'll, I'll show uh, my thoughts tonight. Although the last chapter on credit foreshadowed some present day developments. Uh, Zarlinga says that George's Social Problems, which was uh, 1884, provided great political clarity on money and banking. So we need to get away from this idea that uh, uh, George was getting uh, senile or something where he wasn't really on top of his game uh, during his, writing his last book. It's uh, actually it's the opposite of that. Uh, Zarlinga's American Money Institute says that by misdefining the nature of money, special interests control our money system and society itself. To critique George's views on money, it's important to understand the history of money. So uh, what I'm doing tonight is taking uh, chapters eight, uh, 16 to 19 uh, of his lost science of money uh, and uh, um, go into that development um, uh, with his um, with George's moral viewpoint and investigations. He came to the uh, correct conclusions on how the U.S. money system should operate. So this is what uh, Zarlinga is concluding in his forty-four page uh, summary. Uh, George's uh, son said that his father thought that money is a sibling of language, interesting way of putting money, not something that's uh, tangible. Uh, universally significant and inseparable from the, advance of, uh, from the advance of mankind. In the following slides, what you'll see is uh, quotes that are in italics, uh, Henry George making comments about money. And that's really the focus of this paper or the focus of this talk tonight is to demonstrate how Henry George had correct ideas about money. So let's uh, get right into uh, some of the things that Henry George said. Uh, money is a natural growth from common perceptions and common needs. Wealth is tangible, but money is abstract. Special interests create confusion upon thought. George said, to eliminate wrong thought, it is necessary to eliminate the source of the controller's power. George believed that he needed to clear up concepts of wealth and value before he dealt with money. So let's look now how George addressed the money question in Progress and Poverty, Social Problems, his second book, major book, uh, Protection, Free Trade, and then uh, the the periodical that he authored uh, uh, starting about uh, 1888 and uh, thereafter. So um, I think I'll, I'll stop here. If uh, anybody had any uh, specific questions or point out something, uh, Ibrahima, could you uh, see if there's anybody who wanted to uh, comment? Well, I don't see anybody raising their hands. Okay. Um, okay, let me uh, jump right into progress. Oh, Charlie, Charlie just raised his hand. Yeah, I have a question. So who who does own the debt? I'm sorry? You you, you asked earlier, who, who owns the debt? Who owns the debt? Yeah, for the U.S. government. And, and my question is, like, who, who does own the, the debt? 
Well, if uh, the it's the Federal Reserve that uh, issues the currency, so uh, it would be uh, everybody who uh, who's a, a member of uh, or a citizen of the United States. So we all own it because we do have an opportunity to change how banking works. And I think that's one of the key things I'm going to be getting at tonight is that uh, we all own it. Uh, we all have an obligation to change things when we suspect that things aren't right. And that's really what's been the problem over the years. Uh, does that answer that? Yeah, I think that, you know, I, I guess if you read Piketty, right, he, he claims that rich people essentially are the owners of the principle of that debt and often are service through generations of debt that is passed down. But I think your point is is well taken. Okay, thanks. Because, you know, one of the things I'm going to be bringing up is the fallacy that we need to sell treasuries in order to raise the money to pay for stuff. And that's one of the things that I hope you get out from after the, uh, from this talk. So let me go right into progress and poverty, showing what Henry George said. Uh, the laborer who receives his wages and money uh, really receives in return um, a draft on the general stock, which he may utilize. This is the the uh, the labor theory of value that he's uh, attacking, that uh, a capitalist will uh, extend uh, capital to the, the labor, uh, but rather Henry George believes that the uh, that there's a general stock created when uh, labor uh, mm -hmm. works. And that neither money, which is but the draft, nor the particular form of wealth which he uses uh, it to call for, represents advances of capital for his maintenance, but on the contrary, represents the wealth of a portion of a wealth his labor has already added to the general stock. So this is a, some points that uh, Henry George makes uh, famously within uh, Progress and Poverty. Uh, making this distinction between wealth and money is usually a key step on the road to a fuller monetary awareness. It's not an obvious step for it requires abandoning a more comfortable concrete view of money as a tangible physical thing and adopting a view that, of money as an abstract power. For example, those insisting on gold backing for money have usually not taken this first step. And this is all on page 62 if you want to research the uh, these quotes in Progress and Poverty. He continues that this universal truth is so often obscured is largely due to the fruitful source of economic obscurity, the confounding of wealth with money. Mm -hmm. uh, so going back to um, uh, Zarlinga, he observes the regression to metallism in the 19th to 20th century can be traced back to uh, Adam Smith and his Wealth of Nations uh, on uh, monetary errors. Mm -hmm. Greenback supporters, including George, overcame those errors of the earlier theorists. Interesting real world example of what the US should do with money uh, with his setting up of an emergency system, money system for a, a friend, Tom Johnson from uh, Cleveland, who is a very uh, famous supporter of Henry George. And what he told <coughs> George, or what he told Tom uh, 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 Johnson was as the US could, the company could issue from its own treasury a paper currency based on its credit and interchangeable or in uh, and credit and interchangeable with its bonds. So that's the, the in a nutshell how the the banking system should work. So contrary to economic opinion, this type of greenback monetary proposal has never really been discredited. This is Zarlinga talking but has merely been smeared and ignored as have Georgia houses or views on land. Hmm. In fact, the present Federal Reserve System can be viewed as a form of such a proposal, although the critical flaw added that the Fed is privately owned and privately managed, 
opening the door to conflicts of interest and the establishment of uh, a, a special monetary privileges. So let's um, maybe stop there, see if there was any questions about what I just covered, if there was anything that was unclear. If not, we can go directly into social problems. There's plenty of time, I think, to, uh, if you want to remember the slide number, that might be the uh, way to do this in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, so in social problems, 1884, uh, oh, we got a question? Yeah, yeah, Edward has a question. Oh, sure. Um, I just wanted to say that I, I'm pretty sure with regard to greenbacks, the reason that they were successful during the Civil War is that the Union said after the war, when we have sufficient gold stocks, these greenback this greenback currency can be replaced with gold certificates, which would then be redeemable in gold. And so that future confidence uh, gave people a reason to accept the greenbacks, even though they weren't redeemable. I think the first ones were probably 1878 when they started to be on a par with gold. Yeah, I think what happened was that uh, there was like a, a separate market where people would trade them outside of official channels. But yeah, I agree that there was a, a mechanism that was uh, promised in the future. Uh, I guess my position is that they they really didn't need to do that but i think people had this uh this uh, uh, uh fondness uh, of having something linked to something tangible as gold and that might have provided the, the additional uh justification for allowing it to happen but yeah uh, uh, marty i think there was also a great deal of fear of the wildcat banking experience yeah, yeah. You know that. In fact, I'm going to be bringing uh, something up about the wildcat uh, banking. Yeah, uh, for people who are not familiar, it was after the uh, the the cancellation of the second national bank that, uh, uh, based on the original reform of well the program of Alexander Hamilton, you had uh, you know the lack of a, a national banking system and uh, wildcat banking. Uh, the, that banking uh, system was uh, 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 fraught with problems because you'd have a bank, let's say, in Missouri issuing uh, currency. And if you were in Pennsylvania and you're holding these things, it may not be worth anything because you'd have to travel all the way to Missouri to cash it in. So, yeah, that was a, a problem. I think that was a, uh, a factor in uh, questioning uh, the, the the value of the the greenback, but that was a good question. Appreciate you bringing it up. Well, let's go into the social problems. Um, going more into the Marty, uh, Alison has a question. I think I'm sorry. Alison has a question. Sure. Oh, thank you. And um, sorry to interrupt as you're going forward, and I don't mind just footnoting for a conversation later, but I think, I think it's interesting about the wildcat banking period. And so I had some conversation around that and what it might mean for what's being recommended with Georgism yeah. and what potentials are in terms of government, and et cetera, and various kinds of currencies and new capacities and new definitions of wealth. So yeah. let me just footnote it and listen to you for now. Okay. Okay. Yeah, well... <laughs> but, uh I, just to let you know that I'm going to be uh, uh, quoting Henry George, and I guess I agree with Henry George's position on this, is that uh, he's calling for a uh, uh, government-issued uh, currency, which is uh, maybe the direct opposite of wildcat banking, where people everywhere will create a currency. But yeah, I pre appreciate you bringing it up. So let me uh, uh, jump uh, right in. We got another question. There's another comment. Sure. There's another person who raised the hand. Okay. I see the hand disappeared. So you may, you may want to continue, Marty. Okay. Well, I, I think this well, that, is was, a... that was me. I had a question. Sure. Go ahead. Okay. You want to ask it now? Yeah. Isn't 
isn't the concept of using metals like gold and silver uh basically they're just a representation of wealth because they have no they have very little practical application as far as tool making or general living isn't well I think, I think the point that henry george and uh and zarlinga uh make a point is that it's limiting in uh, what you can do and there's no need to limit the the uh, utility of of currency to uh, uh, to metals for example he, he makes a point and i'll be, be getting into this is that well why not just keep the silver in the ground uh, and base the currency on uh, material that yet to be uh, dug up and cr created into silver bars so um so I, I do address the the metallism. So maybe we can uh, go forward. Then, if I didn't cover it, we can bring it back up. So um, going to the social problems, just to show uh, Henry George's ideas on money. So Zolinga says by 1884, George had demonstrated a fully fully developed concept of how an advanced monetary system ought to operate. It is not the business of government to direct employment of labor and capital and to foster certain industries at the expense of other industries, leading to waste, loss, and corruption. So here you see ideas about uh, unnecessary government intervention. But on the other hand, it is the business of government to issue money. And this is... Uh, uh, addressing the issue of the wildcat banking. This is perceived as soon as the great labor-saving use of money supplants barter. To leave it to everyone who choose to issue money would be to entail general inconvenience and loss, to offer many temptations to roguery, and to put poorer classes of society at a great disadvantage. And I'm sure he was referring to the wildcat uh, experience. Uh, and continuing on with social problems, these obvious considerations have everywhere as society became well organized led to the recognition of the coinage of money as an exclusive function of government. When in progress of society, a further labor saving improvement becomes possible by the substitution of paper for the precious metals as the material for money, the reasons why the issuance of money should be made a government function become still clearer. And then continuing on, the evils entailed by wildcat banking, and this is George talking, in the U.S. are well too well remembered uh, to need reference. Well, I, I think probably need to reference today because <laughs> he was talking way back in 1884. This is after the failure, uh, well, the rescinding of the contract for the second bank of the United States, which was a 20 year period. The loss uh, and inconvenience, the swindling and corruption that flowed from the assumption of each state of the union, the power to license banks as issue uh, of issue ended with the war and no one would want to go back to them. So this is him uh, speaking 20 years after the Civil War. Yet instead of doing what every public consideration impels us to, um, the private interests of bankers have up to this point compelled us to use a hybrid currency. So this is what he's talking about at his time, uh, the way that the private bankers have uh, uh, situated themselves within the, the banking system. He's He's calling it a, a national uh, banking system, of which part uh, through guarantee by uh, general government is issued and made profitable to corporations. The legitimate bank, a business of banking, and this is some of the key parts of the uh, material tonight. Uh, the legitimate business of banking, the safekeeping and loaning of money and the making and exchange of credits is properly left to individuals and associations. So he's talking about uh, private banking, but by leaving to them, even in part uh, and under restrictions and guarantees, the issuance of money, the people of the United States suffer an annual loss of millions 
of dollars and sensible increase in the influences which exert a corrupting effect upon the government. So this is a, a good question of uh, how to go about doing this. And I will be addressing the Chicago plan from the New Deal period. I have uh, some extensive material at the end of this lecture, if there's enough interest in talking about that. Because one of the things I'm gonna be uh, discovering, which I didn't know before I read um, the science of political economy is how Henry George's ideas uh, in, uh, had uh, affected or kind of directed the, the Chicago plan. So uh, the money for private loaning money into existence would be provided by government. And I'll be explaining this sentence by uh, explaining the, uh, well, uh, pointing to the 100% reserve requirement. Which this, uh, these ideas are, are not uh, common sense or uh, maybe readily understood, but uh, what he's getting at here is the, uh, and this is my speaking, it's not a tail size, so it's not Henry George saying this, but the um, one of the ways that uh, money is created by private banks is the the loaning of money into existence. So Henry George is saying that uh, that shouldn't be uh, uh, an activity that private banks should uh, should do. So going back to Zarlanga, uh, he says that it's normally very difficult to write about monetary systems as concisely as George does here and still remain accurate. So uh, he's giving a lot of credit to Henry George. That George has done so indicates he put a lot of time and effort into it. Uh, George continued to express his view for um, about 15 years until his death. And like I say, uh, we see George's prescriptions for money reflected in the Chicago plan as proposed in 1934 in New Deal banking reform. So I think I'll, I'll stop again here and see if there's any additional questions. I, th I think this is working out very well where we're trying to gauge where the, whether people are still on track with what I'm saying. If not, we got one or two slides on protection or free trade. I'll uh, continue on. You, know, you can always get with the, the next uh, break period. So uh, what can be clear then that a note directly issued by the government is at least as good as a note based on a government bond? Yet special interests have sufficed with us to institute and maintain a hybrid currency. And this is what he's talking about, private interests in the national banking system, for which no valid reason can be assigned than private profit. So that's... Uh, a one quote deal in the protection of free trade. Uh, is there any uh, any questions before I go on to his periodical, the the standard? So let's um, let's go into this. Uh, by means of the national banking system, we have permitted the holders of large part of the public debt to enjoy the principal while they draw interest. And this is the same thing of uh, selling treasury notes and, uh, and drawing interest on money that the federal government has. Uh, through the national banking system, the banker was, was allowed to draw from the government $80,000 in money for every 100,000 in bonds he deposited, and then to draw interest on the whole 100,000. So this is a scheme that was uh, current back then. Um, it, it not content with this, as though from the mere desire of paying as much interest as possible and making the redemption of our public debt as slow as possible, we are actually buying up enormous amounts of silver for which we have no use than for so many tons of cobblestones and storing them away in vaults. Uh, Treasury Secretary Fairchild sees the absurdity of coining the silver and proposes instead that it shall be stowed away in bars. 
but why not leave the silver in the ore and the ore in the ground? That would be far greater economy. As for silver notes, they would be just as useful and just as readily taken if they were promised to pay silver yet to be mined and refined. Or if instead of promising to pay anything at all, they were just, they were simply made receivable for public dues. So he's addressing the the um, the uh, the metallism issue. And then on April 28th, 1888 in the standard, he says there were never uh, there never was any good reason for the institution of a national banking system as the system that was in existence back in 1888. And there is not today any good reason for its continuance. Like all special privileges, it is but a taxation of the many for the benefit of the few. And like all use of government power for private advantage, it has resulted in governmental extravagance and political demoralization. The pretense that there is some mystery about currency and banking that some people cannot understand is like the pretense that no one but the members of a protected rings and trusts are competent to say what tariff taxes shall be levied on the people. Uh, the national bank notes current in the United States fulfill the functions of generally accepted money, not because they have the name of the bank printed on them, not because bonds are deposited for their redemption, but because they are issued by the general government and the bear the stamp and rest upon its credit. They are no wise better than the notes directly issued by government, but drive their security and usefulness from the same source that give, uh, gives the greenback its security and usefulness. The fact that they are issued by the government and are receivable for its dues. The proper business of banking, it says it once again, is the receiving and keeping and the loaning out of money and the facil facilitation of exchanges by the extension, interchange and cancellation of private credits. With the issuance of money, the proper business of banking has nothing whatever to do with it. To withdraw the national bank currency and to substitute it for notes directly issued by the government would be to save annually for the millions of, for the people, millions directly and still more millions indirectly, but it would not in the least interfere with the proper bank uh, business of banking. So I know we, we went through all those uh, quotations of Henry George kind of kind of quick, but just trying to set ourselves up for a further analysis, but we'll uh, take a little break here uh, for any questions. And as a question, Marty. Oh, hey, Marty, I was just thinking as you're going through this, for a sovereign nation, it works pretty well, except that, for example, in Henry George's time, the Chinese asked to be paid in silver and other foreign uh, industries, companies, whatever, would they, they would have to be willing to accept whatever paper currency is being issued uh, by the sovereign government. Yeah. And I don't, you know, I, I think that that's just, I don't know what we do in terms of creating a perfect monetary system to get another country's uh, entrepreneurs uh, or government to accept our currency if that currency isn't redeemable in something specific. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I guess if, if you go, if you think about the uh, the period that we're talking about, uh, the 1840s, 1860s, where uh, China was attacked by Britain and the United States, for that matter, in the opium wars, they were uh, charging a lot of, uh, well, they were selling tea and making fantastic amounts of money uh, payable in silver. And um, one way that Britain and the United States got their silver back was to sell the opium and um, get him addicted to uh, to that uh, that uh, opioid. It's kind of an interesting uh, uh, change of events where now China's sending the uh, the fentanyl over. But uh, 
but yeah, uh, uh, in a in a currency, um, uh, you have to deal with what people are asking for it. So if we have the silver, there was a uh, uh, a trade dollar that the United States had. Uh, I think I'm I cover that in a uh, in one of the other lectures where the United States tried to issue a trade dollar that had more silver in it than the trade dollar from Mexico. But since the the Chinese were more used used to the Mexican trade dollar that had lower silver, they they would uh, choose those rather than the others. So uh, it's a matter of what what uh, the the nation that's uh, buying uh, wants um, in exchange for what they have. So it's a and if you think about the United States and the uh, the mid 1800s, uh, you know, there there still was a question about whether the United States is still a viable nation after going through a civil war, and uh, so yeah, that was an early early years of um, of international trade. So I think your point is is well taken that uh, nations around the world weren't taking. Uh, sovereign dollar, you know, currency, paper money, uh, they're still attached to the uh, the metal. So if there's uh, no other questions, let me uh, go well, with, I, I'm sorry. I have a question. Yeah. Are we only talking about uh, government bonds or are we also talking about when a bank lends creating money through double dipping on accounts? Well, yeah, we're also talking about the the private uh, creation of money, uh, the what's called uh, uh, loaning into existence. So we're going to be uh, uh, showing that the New Deal reform, uh, they called it the 100% reserve backing, was a way of eliminating that uh, loaning into existence. So if you hold on, I guess we'll will uh, address that. So, uh, Alison? I'm sorry? I'm gonna hold on as well again. I'll lower my hand. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. No problem. So, um, so George, uh, so Zerlinga says that George's view on monetary reform is that of the greenback position. Through the Civil War, the Union issued $450 million uh, in, and this is uh, that currency back in 1860, of convertible to gold paper currency to finance the war. The currency phased out uh, in 1879. The Confederacy had their own fiat currency, but the war was fought primarily in the South. So the mechanism that was used uh, uh, was particularly useful in the North, but not in the South. North was largely spared the significant impacts to manufacturing and economic advance. Those of the plutocracy, which I guess is the deep state uh, today, will always scream about the risks of inflation when the government has a free hand in creating and issuing uh, money. Yet in the more modern period during times of war, the money power partly to assure their own survival has stood aside and acquiesced in government issuing money as in the revolution and civil war or issued it in large quantities themselves if allowed to get away with it uh, as in world war one and two and i'm and i'm not sure of the exact example that zarlinga is pointing to but apparently uh, there was uh, evidence of that uh, in doing this they could be sure that the resulting production would be blown up and sunk or be useless rather than go uh, end up as new consumer goods or new production facilities or improved infrastructure, which would have tended to lower prices and to have made the population more independent of the monetary miscreants. So you can see uh, Zarlinga giving George a lot of credit for being uh, modern in his uh, thinking. Um, any questions on that the material I just presented? So 
I wanted to make sure I get into the history of the um, Chicago plan because it's kind of interesting how what I've just presented gets uh, uh, melded into that. If there's no other questions, uh, I, I'm going to present right now a uh, an original analysis that I came up with to, uh, well, not this, the, the slide after this one. But I, let me uh, do this one slide before I talk about the other thing. Uh, in the in science of political economy, uh, it's interesting how Henry George uh, talks about uh, two aspects of uh, say the uh, the federal government. He talks about the body politic and the body economic. And uh, uh, I don't think a whole lot of Georgists have really studied the science of political economy because I never really hear this distinction being made. And I've been around Georgism for, uh, for about 14 years now. But uh, body politic is what uh, Hobbes called the Leviathan the integration of individual men, the state civilization already in existence, the bodies, politics prior to civilization. But he says that the body economic precedes and underlies the body politic. Uh, it's what George called the greater Leviathan, the subject of political economy. So the subject of political economy to Henry George was not what the uh, the government that we understand and the mechanism and the Congress and the politics of uh, government, but it's more on uh, the subject of what people need, what society needs, what infrastructure is needed. He also called it the body industrial or the body social, uh, the body economic, when men uh, are cooperating to supply wants. So this is a a key point of understanding where Henry George is coming from when he's talking about money and he's talking about political economy. He's talking about people sharing, and it's not the economics that uh, originated in the uh, 1880s, 90s, and then turned into neoclassical economics where everything is uh, selfishness and uh, private advantage. Henry George had a different idea about what uh, what money was. So let me uh, uh, cover this and then we can go to the next um, uh, slide and getting into the uh, Chicago plan. I came up with uh, something original after studying the uh, the book, The Science of Political Economy, and it kind of taking, uh, uh, um, kind of extending something that I originated in 2020 when I uh, went to the Eastern Economic Association and presented a, a paper called Cooperative Economics, which you can uh, find in academia.edu under my name. So I, I, I came up with a, recently I came up with a five-part theory of reflexivity, uh, even though in uh, 2020 I had a three-part, so I extended it by two types of uh, reflexivity. So uh, after reading George, I realized that he spoke of some of the same ideas. So um, just bear with me now. It's uh, about four or five slides here. The framework is called Quint Lexivity. It starts with people, or well, it starts with simple, second, and triple. This is what I uh, talked about in 2020. So Pavlov's dog reflects the simple reflex of the action and reaction without much thought. Millions of people occupy this frame. Nothing wrong with it. It's just where people are. Market capitalism is the second reflexive where money, capital, and land are utilized to exploit labor, not complicated and not from unfamiliar to most. It's the triple reflexive that's a bit complicated where major religions dwell, providing moral lessons about service to mankind and the path out of a possible evil in the second reflective, uh, think about cooperation. However, it's a slippery slope to the nefarious, this is what I call the neflexive, the uh, fourth the reflexive, occupied by mobsters in the World Economic Forum, military and censorship, industrial complexes who play the play on the good nature of those in the triple reflexive and 
twist the apparent realities and join with the second reflectives to institutionalize an unjust advantage. Then it comes to the, the, the last, which is the fifth, the quint flexives who have achieved a nirvana state having experienced the lower four reflexivities and understand the gamesmanship. And this is uh, occupied by people such as Martin Luther King who saw the promised land. Some exposed global conspiracies of the money power only to be silenced by the reflexive power of money and influence. And if you look at George, he also saw a promised land and expressed some of the same ideas. And it's not too uh, much of a stretch understanding that uh, Martin Luther King read Henry George and uh, understood his message. So in conclusion with this little uh, sidebar here, it's easy for Quint Fluxives to be belittled as conspiracy theorists or outed as real or manufactured scandals. Many seek in the first three flexivities because the power of the influence of the flexives wouldn't have it any other way. So uh, any questions before we jump into the Chicago plan? I know that was some original stuff and- maybe, Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's what I was gonna say. If there's links that we could look into all of those reflexive or something uh, uh, again, and this is reflecting Georgia, Georgism or, or your interpretations of it? This is my interpretations of how to understand reality and to situate people such as uh, Martin Luther King and Henry George within the pantheon of thought and political action that uh, when you get into politics, you start to realize that to do good means that you're, you're up against people who have access to uh, 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 immense, immense power. And uh, so uh, I was just trying to situate what George was getting at in the science of political economy and uh, put it that way. So you can uh, put it off to the side, put it in the back of your mind if you like. Well, if, Marty, no... if we wanted to find out more about that, your thoughts on that, have you got a link or something to it? Yeah, if you go to academia.edu and you put my name, M-A-R-T-Y, uh, Roland, R-O-W-L-A-N-D, you, you'll pick up what, uh, the paper called um, Cooperative Economics. That's where I introduced the first three levels. Of... And thanks to Charlie, he already put the link in the chat. Okay, I'll do that when I uh, finish. He, he... It's all done. Charlie did that. But yeah, it's all, or yeah. somebody. Okay. Well, uh, but you had five levels and you you only have three on the website. Is that right? I'm sorry? You said you had five levels? Yeah, Quint five levels. Quint so so I, I, added, I added two to the, the three levels that I talk about in the cooperative economics. So, and, you know, this, this lecture is going to be uh, recorded. So, or it is recorded. So, you can go back and and review that what I just said. Thank so you. I wanted to end the uh, the talk tonight on of the Chicago plan because it's very important because this is where Henry George's ideas from the uh, late eight, uh, 19th century were incorporated into something that's within our institutional knowledge. We've got some familiarity with the the New Deal and. Uh, what was done in the banking reforms. Um, so I wanted to say that uh, there's a link that I did put into the chat. The Levy Economics Institute uh, wrote a 44 page uh, paper on the Chicago plan. It was a guy named Ronnie Phillips. I think it was uh, 1992 he wrote it. Um, so few sources, I think, uh, make this point, but the fundamental content, content of the Chicago Plan was considered by Congress uh, in 1934-35 uh, were ideas about uh, Georgia's ideas about money. There are uh, eight economists that were involved in the uh, Chicago Plan. You might know of uh, Frank Knight. Um, Henry Simons, I understood, is rumored to be a Georgist, but I couldn't find a link.
but he plays uh, prominently in this. And I wouldn't doubt that a, a Georgist was uh, involved in uh, the congressional effort to implement a, a banking reform because it's clear that he had a uh, had some influence. So George said, and you might recall that it is the business of government to issue money. Uh, the Chicago plan said the Federal Reserve Bank should liquidate assets of all uh, member banks, pay off the liabilities, dissolve all existing banks, and uh, create new institutions. Uh, George said the money for private loaning money into existence provided by government, thereby eliminating the power of private banks to issue currency. And uh, and I, I have a little image of somebody doing a, a, a Heimlich maneuver because this was a very strong pill to take um, in the Chicago plan, which was uh, uh, wasn't adopted. In the Chicago plan, it was a new private banks to accept only demand deposit subject to 100% reserve requirement. So I'll have to explain that. Uh, but this is the guy who would have uh, saw the Chicago plan to uh, fruition if he had lived. So let me uh, talk about these characters and uh, then we can get on to the, the end of this talk. Uh, the Secretary of Agriculture was very involved in this banking reform because of the the problem of the farmers during the, the 30s. And uh, it was to their benefit that uh, the banking reform was looking at. So you had Gardner Means who was under Tugwell. So the first one was Rexford Tugwell and then Means and then Senator Bronson Cutting who is the image that we have on the left. And then Mariner Eccles, a very important person, a Mormon banker who is involved in uh, the Chicago plan, uh, then Treasury Department, a guy named Curry. And then uh, I wanted to point out that uh, this whole effort was killed by Senator Carter Glass, uh, identified in the, the Levy Institute paper as a Jacksonian Democrat, which I think is significant. Uh, and here's Herbert Hoover. So before the 29 banking crash, he had her uh, Hoover asked uh, Congress uh, for uh, some kind of reform. Weeks later, Congress created the authority to loan money to banks in 33 before FDR came into office, which was in March. There was a rash of banking holidays in half the states. And then March 33, Roosevelt takes office and declares a uh, uh, six day national bank holiday. So in the early days, uh, 33, Roosevelt expressed concern for the plight of the debtor class, including farmers, 90% uh, of the population. There was an emergency banking that was passed, uh, with no permanent solution. The banks reopened and the bank runs ended. Uh, in uh, March 13, uh, 33, 40 people were given a confidential copy of the Chicago plan that was written by those, those eight people, including uh, uh, Henry Wallace, who was Secretary of Agriculture. Here's an image of an interesting guy named uh, George Harrison, who is the um, New York uh, Ched, uh, Fed Chair. So Agriculture Adjustment Act was passed, uh, authorizing the government to issue greenbacks if he liked. Um, then the Banking Act of 33, which was the also named the Glass-Steagall Act, was uh, June 16th. It had a, uh, well, it didn't include the 100% reserve requirement, but um, the Fed did uh, did not use all the means available to it. Uh, the Chicago, Chicago plan would have limited the power of the New York Fed and strengthened the DC Fed. So there's a little bit of politics going on. And this is the uh, Henry Simons, the rumored Georgist. Uh, authors of the plan received feedback on their initial proposal. Plan was revised, largely written by Simons. He noted that the Fed failed in its primary function of controlling the currency by allowing private banks to usurp the uh, this power. 
he called it the result was a perverse manipulation of the currency. And this is uh, uh, thinking back in Henry George's uh, uh, description. Simon said that solution was the outright absolution of private, uh, well, absolution of deposit banking on the fraction, fractional reserve principle. The Fed banks would not have the reserve requirement. No private bank credit replaced by the Fed uh, bank credit. Only currency would be Fed notes. Government would create deposits if the Fed, if the private banks could not attract them. So this is, answers the question of, well, what do you do when a private bank wants to loan money to somebody who wants to build a house? Well, rather than loaning money into existence, the federal uh, the Fed would provide the money and do it that way. So this is uh, uh, Tugwell. Uh, private uh, banks were thus limited to a lending capacity of funds so attracted. They would charge a fee for bringing the together borrowers and lenders. The Fed would go to go from interest bearing federal debt to non interest bearing debt uh, and increase federal expenditures and reduce federal taxes. Tugwell knew that the bankers would be opposed to this. Uh, January 34, Roosevelt asked Congress for legislation for sound and adequate currency. Roosevelt was on board vesting government with monetary matters, and then the Chicago group got busy. Uh, Senator Bronson Cutting was a progressive La Follette uh, type, a Republican opposed to the private banks power. Private banks would not be allowed to create credit, which is uh, opposed to how banks do it today. Cutting, uh, this is a picture from New, uh, New, uh, New Mexico. He was disappointed that FDR did not nationalize banks in the first weeks in office during the uh, depression. Now they had a fight on their hands. So he was saying that uh, FDR missed an opportunity to implement the uh, Chicago plan ideas. Cutting said bankers are collecting tribute from the community on the community's credit. Commercial banking and issuing credit should be a government function. Uh, then a bill was introduced saying it, it would uh, stabilize monetary systems, prevent inflation, depressions, and restore prosperity, and then establish a federal monetary authority uh, controlling supply of currency. So Cutting and FDI were at odds, and this gets into the, the politics of life. Uh, it had to do with the veterans pension reform. And uh, so there, therefore Cutting's bill was, was doomed. Uh, work continued on the bill forming the backbone of the Banking Act of 35. So this is the Banking Act that essentially uh, provided the, the system that we have today. A key person to draft that act was Mariner Eccles, the uh, the Mormon banker, on the recommendation of uh, Secretary of Treasury Morgenthau. Uh, I guess the point I'm going to make here is that uh, I think that Mariner Eccles wasn't up to the task, and I think Morgenthau knew that. And in the politics of it all, the 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 political system was set up to have Mariner Eccles. Eccles fail, which would give a uh, opportunity for the bankers to get what they wanted. So Eccles said that he take the job if he could reduce the power of the Fed's regional bank. Uh, Carter Glass was the Senate Banking Committee chair, a Jacksonian Democrat. He feared government centralization. And you'll recall that it was a Jacksonian Democrat that, uh, um, well, it was Jackson himself that uh, dissolved the Second National Bank of the United States, which led to the um, the wildcat banking. So it's kind of like coming full circle. So Glass opposed the Chicago plan, which was uh, featured by Eccles and Cutting. So uh, some say it was suspicious, but uh, in May 35, Cutting dies in a plane crash. Uh, some progressives blamed FDR for his death. Who knows? Uh, so the Banking Act of 35 was signed in, um, in August, so uh, three months later. It did not have the requirement for 100% reserves. 
So the idea behind the 100% reserves is that is that uh, they wouldn't be able to uh, create uh, money uh, out of loaning, that they'd have to use the, the reserves to issue the money. And if they needed uh, uh, extra currency, the federal government would give it to them. So the bankers lobbyists called this uh, 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 the Banking Act 35 weak tea. And the bill only granted the Fed power to change reserve requirements. So the basic framework continues today. There's no requirement for 100% reserves. Saying of the Eccles bill, the most dangerous and unwarranted measure of the New Deal. And then he boasted, we did not leave enough of the Eccles bill in the act with enough to light a cigarette. Uh, now, I didn't talk at all about uh, Irving Fisher, but uh, he had ideas that uh, kind of, he's been associated with the Chicago plan. So Irving Fisher spent the remainder of his life lobbying Congress and uh, the public on the need for 100% reserve. So uh, that's really all the slides I have. The point or the, um, the links that I have here are all in the uh, are all in the chat. So uh, Ibrahima, if you want to uh, open up the the chat, well, it's time to uh, have a, a full discussion of all the slides today. Sure, thank you, Mari. So it's open. You may just uh, activate your mic and ask your question. I see Anthony. Thanks, Ebrahima. Just for the point of clarity, 100% reserves, if you think of a modern bank balance sheet, what you're talking about is the bank is restricted to lending the cash and cash deposit, cash-like, not deposits, cash and cash-like instruments. That's yeah. it. Yeah, and this is... In other words, put simply, the money that it has in the vault. Yeah, it's the... The kind of thing that a lot of people believe that what banks do anyway, uh, there's still a, a belief that, uh, that the banks don't create money by loaning it. Uh, a lot, uh, the, the belief that uh, people deposit money and these other things and what they loan out is the money that's sitting there in the bank. Uh, so by having 100% reserves means that you create what most people think banks do anyway, but uh, uh, Irving Fisher has a very good description of what I just described, and I have that in the chat. It was called 100% uh, money. Uh, so if you need any more uh, description of that system, uh, look at that link. But that you're, you're correct. That's what 100% uh, reserves mean. And it's kind of interesting that... Uh, that Henry George uh, believed that he didn't use that term, but he was saying that the private bank shouldn't have the ability to create currency. Thank you. I just wanted to say that uh, the links aren't in the chat. We can't find them. The links aren't in the chat. So uh, yeah, I know I had a problem. Uh, so let me... Um, let me get out of this. Let me let me do this. Thank you so much for that presentation. There's... Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Let me, uh, okay, we got those in the chat. Now yeah. Let me, uh, let me go into the next. Oops. Thank you. And I don't know if it's possible for the links to be sent out to the, us who registered for this call, because that's an easy way to access them as well. But I'll leave that to the coordinators. And I'd love to follow up on the point that was just made as a part of a follow up to the whole talk. Um, this uh, requirement for there to be 100% backing rather than allowing factional reserve is interesting because it does play back into what's sitting in there. You know, if you have notes that are issued based upon how much cash is it? Wait, notes based upon notes? What is it notes based upon gold, which is really created in order to be a note that's based upon, you know, so we're going back to what you said, I think, at the beginning, which is uh, having a new way of understanding 
value and wealth, right? Yeah. So I think my question to you that had come earlier and and the model that I feel like I'm looking at money from this lens that reflects a bit of the, the wild banking and, you know, so basically that the money needs to be backed by, by what backed by some value. Well, is right. the, the, mm-hmm. the faith and trust in the, the government. Uh, well, the- it, it's, 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 so that's an interesting one, right? Because what service is the government offering sort of like the, the, the person who brought up the international trade and, uh, and in that way, the bank core would have been backed, for instance, by, by Keynes in after, right after Brenton Woods, would have been backed by a basket of goods and services from that country. And then, you know, the green belt, the greenback or whatever currency the government's issue, issuing would be backed by goods and services that are offered, you know, whether it's healthcare. So that has to be backed by that, that's sort of redeemed for those things not issued beyond what is redeemable. The same thing could happen at a community level or community bank level or an individual level. And I and I just wanted to see if that makes sense to anybody because it's clear as day to me. <laughs> it seems to be the only way to go. And we just keep skirting. Gonna, yeah. yeah, I'll leave that open for people. Uh, Ed or anybody else? Uh, Walter, are you, uh, you on today? Well, Joe Polito had his uh, hand up earlier, so Joe, let Joe uh, respond. Sure, I'll respond to that question first. Um, uh, Aristotle said that money is a creature of the law, and I think that's you know that really nails it. Um, yeah. we have we have um, credentials. People have uh, professional licenses. People have car licenses. They have deeds. Yeah. All of these are legal documents which yeah. authorize things right. um it's it's about authority uh the you know hmm. i think it was the incas didn't even have money it was just direct authority our, <laughs> our you know uh, in the empire but but we have we have this legal uh, authorization and it's 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 um it, it's quite the reverse we do not need anything to back the money what we need is a system of contracts and 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 the law to have a a consistently priced medium of exchange. Uh, and, yeah, thank you for well, that. I'd like to say, speak to that a little bit, especially with this word authority, and because I, I'd like to propose accountability. Sub- can substitute the word authority, and the and the reason why I say that is simply because what authority ends up looking like sometimes is military authority. You know, it's a, it's the ability to enforce the value and who has the most authority oftentimes is the one with the most force. And yet what we're really looking for is whether or not, you know, through laws, if these are legal documents, as you say, Mm -hmm. that there is enough accountability to be able to make good on the promises and enough um, safety and security to address and, and the risk because not every promise will be fulfilled. Not well, every well Keynes, Keynes talked about that, and he talked about yeah. investment. And what Keynes said was that the banks create uh, money, this legal entity, this purchasing power, to invest, and the investment uh, mobilizes capital and labor, and we produce more. So the income occurs after the the authorizing of money to purchase these resources and mobilize them. The the savings comes after. People say, well, you've got to have the savings, you've got to have some sort of backing to to do this, but it's it's quite the reverse. We produce things and then we have the wealth that backs the money that was issued to mobilize these things. Yeah, I, I think that they both work because but I Anyways, the, the question I would like to ask, Mark, is how do we get... that was a great um, presentation. Yeah, she's, she's breaking up a little bit, but uh, Joe, you had. A... I, I, yeah, I, I want to thank you, first of all, for the presentation and the issue. Um, I, I, a couple of little details that I think I'm aware of. Lachlan Curry was the president's economist 
and he did, I think, succeed in producing legislation, but Carter Glass, as you said, sabotaged it. Uh, Eccles, you mentioned Eccles, that, that uh, maybe some thought he wasn't up to the job. I think he was probably the finest um, uh, Fed chair there ever was, and he produced documents and ideas which were way ahead of his time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, I think Ed has some of his materials on his website. Yeah. I think maybe if I, I would to restate it was that he was uh, politically naive, maybe that uh, he, he he was smart, but uh, he couldn't pull the Chicago plan across the, the goal line. That's well, I it. think I'm not sure that he fully supported it because he said at the time the banks were, you know, barely making a profit. And so there really wouldn't be much difference. Um, so I don't think he was as supportive as he could be. Now he was, he did come from banking. So, um, but the question I wanted to, the thing I wanted to ask you about is the philosophy. And, and I, I highly agree with the fact what you're saying about George being on top of all this stuff, <clears throat> but we live in a world where, um, we're making government pay interest on the things they have to do. Um, yeah. You know, it, when there's a recession, when there's more unemployment and so forth, firms and individuals cut back, they lay people off, uh, they sell a division, they close a plant, and they can manage. But in those situations, the government actually has to spend more and on reduced revenue. So it seems to me that what, what this plan you described uh, does is it, it prevents us from charging interest for doing what has to be done. It makes yeah. no sense. And I threw that that right Patman quote in there about the fact that if we're really issuing, you know, sovereign money, then why on earth are, would we pay interest to yeah. spend that into the economy? Yeah, I guess every time I have an opportunity on uh, social media X, I, uh, I, I make the point that the United States is not a Kool-Aid stand. And that's <laughs> why I opened up the presentation on that because it, uh, that's what people believe that we we need to sell treasury notes to get the money to well, we don't need mommy to give us lemons i mean it's um i think sometimes it it takes a, a simple e example of something that we all are familiar with to drive the the point home uh so so the 288 billion that we spend every year which was 18% of the of the um of the money we we get, uh, you just um, pay that with newly issued money. But uh, you, you really don't do that until you get you get a handle on these um, people that uh, want to finance the the next war, and they'd probably find uh, some force on Mars that needs to be destroyed to have the, to extend the war there. Uh, you know. Once we understand how the the economy works and how we could have a a sovereign uh, currency to do the kind of things that we need to do, for example, uh, high speed rail. How, why does Europe have it? Why does Japan? Why does China? It's because they they feel that there's a social need to do certain things like that. So in the United States, we we issue billions of dollars to uh, kill uh, Ukrainians. And uh, we think that we're doing something smart. Um, so the the solution would be to 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 issue new currency, pay off the the uh, the debt that we owe on the, all those treasury notes. Uh, it might be a terrific number, but uh, it's irrelevant because going forward we'd be investing in uh, what George called the. Um, the the political economy, which is separate from the 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 body economic, uh, I mean the the body politic, but investing in the body uh, body economic, which is uh, you know healthcare and school and roads and you know uh, it's the opposite of what uh, the politicians on the on the right say that well we we got this deficit we're going to have to cut back and privatize the post office and and uh, all those other things. Well said, Marty. Well, I guess it's my turn for just a minute or two. Sure. And I wish Henry George 
who obviously read Adam Smith, had addressed Smith's analysis of the Bank of Amsterdam and its years when it de operated as a deposit bank, not a lending institution, a deposit bank. And, and an economic historian named Emmanuel Wallerstein wrote that this was the longest period of non-inflationary global economic growth in modern history. Um, and George just ignores Smith's analysis of the Bank of Amsterdam, in which Smith basically uh, said exactly what Wallerstein said, you know, centuries in recent times. So I think th that leads me to believe that George had already made up his mind that it was okay for government to, to just issue the money without any concern about the potential for hyperinflation. And I think that's our major concern with whoever issues the money that is not redeemable in something specific, something specifically tangible, whether that is labor units, whether it's gold or silver, or whether it is, as was suggested by one economist, construction bricks, which yeah. is, is interesting. So I, that's my criticism of Henry George. And as we look to what we need to do going forward to create a, a, a money that has stable purchasing power um, and with increased production comes to have increased purchasing power, I think those are some of our major challenges when we have a fiat currency, whether it's issued by government directly or it's issued by the central bank and then used to purchase government securities, creating the, the debt and the interest payments. Um, I think we we have a lot of room for debate on these issues. Yeah. Uh, I, still, I believe. Yeah, I think the the it, I agree that the the uh, history of the Bank of Amsterdam needs to be uh, studied to see how close that it meets what Henry George was talking well was talking about then in the in the Chicago plan that seems to have a lot of parallels. But I think, uh, you know, I come back to uh, Benjamin Franklin's uh, um, statement to the woman who asked, her, what do we got? And he said, a republic, if you can keep it. And I think that's the the key point of understanding uh, the uh, issue of sovereign money is that that's what's out there. And if we don't get a handle on the uh, the nefarious forces in the, the world that keep us uh, in wars and keep us investing in things that aren't uh, for the common good. Uh, I think that's what we have. So, um, you know, it kind of speaks to the question of, well, what are we sitting on our butts for now? Shouldn't we be out in the streets like the farmers in, uh, in France and Germany? Um, uh, that's a good question because uh, some change needs to happen, and especially uh, as several of us talk about in uh, in uh, 2026 when the next uh, cycle hits, uh, what are we going to be saying then? Uh, you know, we got uh, you know two or three years here to uh, make a, a big point of a major banking reform. Uh, I don't see the groundswell in the United States at the point of, uh, you know, seizing control of the, the government. Uh, I don't know. But you, you brought up a good point. I think it's good to, yeah, I, I, it's really kind of fun to, to read Henry George and read the various people because there's, uh, you can see where he's, uh, he's, um, made up his mind about things and uh, uh, he, he thoroughly uh, trashes uh, um, Adam Smith if you read the science of political economy uh, uh, saying that he's got everything wrong. So and maybe in the case of the Amsterdam Bank, maybe Henry George should have uh, read a little closer. Hey, Jim Fredrickson's got his hand up, Marty. Sure, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, earlier in your talk, in fact, near the beginning of your talk, you cited Connor Dougherty's New York Times article. Yeah, right. I apologize for getting in a little bit late to hear everything that you said about it, but 
the question uh, that I would like to ask is, has anyone suggested to Mr. Dougherty that the title of his talk might have been better if he had included in it what Georgists wanted to remove taxes from in addition to uh, uh, mentioning what Georgists wanted to tax? Yeah. Uh, so I guess my feeling about uh, Connor Doherty and the New York Times is, um, uh, and Ibrahima brought this up to me, is that we should be thankful that Connor wrote the article that he did, but I think it's incumbent on Georgists to be very strong on what it is we are, because here, here we are dependent on on the New York Times to define who we are. So he, he provided this opening and uh, hopefully talks like the one I'm giving tonight and ones that uh, Ed Dodson gives and others give show that uh, we're providing some direction uh, more than a, what was that, uh, a, a warmed up version of QAnon with one of his slights on us. Um, so, you know, it's kind of like the sticks and stones, but, uh, you know, I was talking to uh, my mentor, uh, Daniel Bromley, about something, and he was saying, oh, yeah, I read the New York Times. It looks like they're really promoting Georgism. So that uh, that is a an attitude and a, an opinion that the New York Times did us a favor, uh, but I think uh, it gave us an opening to like drive home the the difference, and you brought up a good point about what George is, uh, you know. It, I, I think what uh, Doherty was getting at was that the uh, the fundamentalist Georges are old timers and uh, have no relevance. But uh, what we see in Detroit is tried and true uh, Georgism uh, being implemented. So I don't think there's any fancy new Georgism that's required. It's the uh, same uh, bread and butter Georgism that uh, just needs to be uh, pursued. Well, that was a good point. I'm glad you uh, brought it up. Marty, just quick. I hope it wasn't my fault. Uh, Connor Doherty interviewed me for about an hour and a half. Well, great. You got to... But I maybe he thought I was one of the cranks. Oh, okay. So he, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. yeah. So, so what do you think about Connor? Did do you think I was accurate? I I don't know. I, I you know, it's like anything else. You write a story for a newspaper, and then the editor says, mm, "I think you may need a different angle." So maybe he maybe the first draft he wrote was very complimentary, and, and somebody on the editorial staff says, "No, you gotta." You got to point out the fact that these guys were the, uh, you know, uh, underside of the economics community. Yeah, yeah. Tinfoil hat economist. That's what he called us. <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. But uh, that's good. So, I'm glad that you had some personal experience with him. Well, maybe he'll call me back one day. I don't know. Uh, Stephen Crozier is up there for you, Marty. Sure. Hi. Right, so I first want to say that I'm... Uh, pretty limited in terms of my understanding of these things, but I do my best and I really do appreciate, you know, the presentation and also Ed, I've sat in on some of your uh, presentations as well. And, and uh, they're always very informative. Uh, my question, I guess, starting off, uh, I, I really uh, think this separation between money and wealth is an important um, uh, distinction to make, uh, especially whenever we have things like wars that uh, actually are so great for the economy, uh, not really so great for wealth when it comes right down to it. Uh, and that being said, uh, always one of the arguments against uh, government creating money is that it's inflationary. And I believe, is it Joel uh, has just put in, in the uh, chat something that I was going to ask about. Why is it never thought of that, um, that private for-profit banks uh, creating money uh, is inflationary. Uh, and I think of that because, Marty, you uh, mentioned a number of things that are for the public good. Uh, if you have good government, which we should have if we, you know, we live in sort of quasi-democracies, uh, if you have good government, 
that money creation should be going towards the public good. Uh, yep. Instead, it's gone towards private profit. And I think, um, you know, the Canadian housing market right now, I live just outside of Vancouver, uh, and how it has been driven up, uh, I think, because of banking pra practices here. Um, so I'm just wondering, why is it not sort of understood that, hey, private for-profit banks can actually cause inflation? I believe... Uh, uh, Polito, uh, sorry, um, yeah. said said about you know hyperinflation is always caused by that. Uh, so yeah. that's my well, question. Well, at the heart of real estate deals is the uh, capitalization of the rent uh, in property. So uh, if you um, uh, another thing that I put on social media on the the X uh, service, I I say that uh, you know if you want affordable housing move to the place where the price of land is zero, which brings up the question, well, how do you get to zero price land? Well, you tax land value. So I'm always begging the question of, of well, how do you get to this, this wonderland of uh, zero price land? But yeah, that's, that's an inflationary and it's only inflationary because of the, the <coughs> economic rent involved in real estate transaction, trying to, to get the future money of the uh, increase in value. Um, yeah, there was an excellent presentation by uh, Georges in California, uh, efforts to uh, to reform the, the Proposition 13, Howard Jarvis. Uh, they're making tr a tremendous headway. They had a, a, a proposition in California to do away with the tax um, uh, tax breaks for commercial properties. Uh, and it only lost by uh, two percentage point. It was 52 uh, no and 48% uh, yes. Yeah. So uh, I think they've, they've struck uh, some uh, good political uh, thought out there. And uh, this is tried and true Georgism, if you understand what they're trying to get at. And they're trying to get at exactly what uh, you brought up about uh, inflation and where the the economic rent is. Uh, and going back to the other point that you mentioned about uh, if we had the type of government that we, we deserve, we would be um, uh, using the sovereign money from the United States uh, to do the kind of things that we need, you know, like, like, who is it going to hurt if uh, we had smarter people, healthier people? Seems like that's something that we'd want to do in the, the the body economic. That's the way Andrew George talks about it. Uh, but uh, Marty, you have Wayne Looney who who still wants to get in, and I guess hey, we, we're just about out of time. So let Wayne make his comment. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I kind of question Joe Palladio's statement that almost, almost all uh, hyperinflation was, was created by uh, private banks. When I think of the really real hyperinflations, uh, they're basically government caused. I'm thinking of Germany, 1923, Hungary, 1946, Zimbabwe a decade ago, and uh, currently Venezuela and Argentina. It's, uh, it's all it's, it's it's really not so much the banking system. It's it's the governments themselves which which are producing wing, money. Wing the the German. Uh, it's been proven that the German hyperinflation was definitely the private banks and the public bank came back in and shut down what they were doing. Um, uh, the Zimbabwe situation was a totally anomalous situation. I think we have to be really careful because people love to use those to criticize. Mm -hmm government money creation and in fact um uh you know in a modern developed economy the people dislike inflation governments don't want to do things that are inflationary the, this is kind of a a, a a false argument that you can't trust the government you know the governments don't want to create inflation because it's it's bad for them politically they just want to be able to do what they're supposed to be doing for the people but uh i, I i'll have to bring in some stuff and send it in but it's it's pretty apparent that most hyperinflations are anomalous situations. They are private produced and the banks are the biggest uh, causes. Well, yeah. Joe, there, 
with regard to Germany, uh, in the 1930s, the Austrian, uh, an Austrian journalist named Bruno Heilig uh, wrote a really persuasive analysis of hyperinflation in Germany that led to the fascist takeover. And he basically points to real speculation in real estate as being the primary cause of the hyperinflation that went through the entire economy. Of course, the banks facilitated that by providing the the lending, the lending. Yeah. And that's what, and that and banks do respond to demand, and you know I mean that's what I did for a living. I I lent money to people, and if you know someone came in and wanted to borrow a half a million dollars, well, provide me the collateral, and if that collateral is the real estate you're purchasing, give me an appraisal. I'll get an appraisal on it to make sure that I have adequate uh, collateral to back up the loan, and if I'm not quite comfortable, I'll say, "Well, do you have anything else to put up?" So, you know, uh, give me a, a mortgage loan on your other buildings or some other assets. So I, I think banks are fairly prudent, but they do contribute by the aggregate activity in pouring more and more money into the economy. And so unless the, as, as has been said, unless more goods and services are being produced equal in value to the input of the new money, you're going to have inflation. Yep. Appreciate the input, uh, Joe and Ed. That was a great uh, response. What, uh, the other aspect of uh, kind of addresses the, the question that was brought up was um, it all depends on uh, what's going on in that nation that's uh, undergoing the, uh, the inflation. You know, if we have the, uh, the skills and the ability, the infrastructure, uh, you know, there's going to be less of a chance of inflationary pressures if uh, we don't have the wherewithal to handle uh, uh, increases in uh, in productivity. So uh, that's where we get differences between nations. Uh, if you got uh, a country that's uh, just coming out of um, uh, a jungle status to something that's very pri uh, primitive, of course, if you start printing out money, there's nowhere to uh, to invest that money, it's all going to go to, uh, you know, private banks and overseas. But Anthony well, I... is asking to join the conversation again. Okay, Marty, uh, let's give Anthony the chance to ask the last question. But I would like to have Josh uh, step in to introduce his class. Let's start in next week. Sure. Yeah. Oh, so that's my turn. Uh, um. I wanted Anthony, if he has Anthony a question first. to ask, yeah, sure. after that. Oh, just an interesting note. I'll just keep it brief. But uh, from my reading of the Weimar inflation, the Bundes Central Bank recommended austerity measures to the, um, the Weimar Republic. And the Weimar Republic said, no, we want you to keep printing money. It was a deliberate, a deliberate action to blow up their economy so they could throw their hands up in the air and say, we can't afford the war reparations. So I think uh, the Germans knew what they were doing. And it was, a, yeah, from my reading, that's the situation. Would you mind sharing that source? This is the first time I'm hearing this. The source, <laughs> yes. I, I will chase up the source. I don't have it on hand. Thank you. Yeah, that was great. I'll send you one too, because I think he's dead wrong. <laughs> I love to compare. Right. <laughs> yeah, we can always debate this. All right. Well, let's uh, allow our friend Josh to step in to introduce uh, our new upcoming course on Silvio Gazelle. All right. Thank you, Ibrahima, and thank you, Marty, for this. Sorry, sorry, I'm going by for this very informative presentation. My name is Josh Sidman, um, and I have a recently formed uh, organization called the Silvio Gazelle Foundation. Um, this presentation was particularly well-timed for me because uh, I learned things about Henry George's views on money that I did not know previously. And I now have a week to think about them and, and incorporate them into my own presentation. My familiarity with George's thinking on money was limited to what I know from progress and poverty. Um, regarding the upcoming course on Silvio Gassel, uh, I knew about and admired the ideas of Henry George before I ever heard the name Silvio Gassel. Uh, Progress and Poverty was one of the most important books informing my own economic worldview. 
to me, George's analysis of the land problem is self-evident and irrefutable. How you solve that problem is a different question, and Henry George and Silvio Gassel had different answers to that question. Um, that's something that we will discuss in the course. Uh, but the majority of the course will focus on the subject of money. Uh, my perspective is that Silvio Gassel's analysis of money can be viewed as a completion of the Georgist economic perspective. Uh, Keynes referred to Gassel as an unduly neglected prophet. To me, that word prophet is very significant. I don't think Keynes threw around words carelessly, and prophet is a very strong word. Uh, personally, I agree with this description. I think Gassel was a prophet of a sort. I think he saw more deeply into the subject of money than any human being throughout thousands of years of thinking about the subject. Um, what ties together Henry George's analysis of land and Silvio Gassel's analysis of money is the phenomenon of unearned income. Our existing systems of land and money both create income streams that go to people who've done nothing to earn it. With land, unearned income takes the form of rent. With money, it takes the form of interest. And both are obvious impediments if the goal of the economic system is for every person to receive the full proceeds of their labor. Because it's just an obvious mathematical fact that if someone is getting income without creating wealth, someone else is creating wealth without receiving income. So from a Gesellian perspective, it's impossible to ever have a fair, stable, robust economic system until we address the problem of unearned income arising both from land and money. And that will be the overarching theme of the course on Gassel. Um, in my mind, while they have their differences, no one who is truly deeply committed to the cause of economic justice should be unfamiliar with either Henry George or Silvio Gassel. Um, of course, at this point, far more people know about Henry George than about Silvio Gassel. So myself and other Gassellians have a lot of work to do. And that's why I'm so excited about the opportunity to speak to all of you uh, about the, the ideas of Silvio Gassel. Um, so once again, thank you, Marty. Thank you, Ibrahima. And I look forward to seeing some of you next week. Thanks, thank you, Josh. And we are all looking forward to this. Sounds exciting already. Well, yeah, good night, yeah, everyone. Thank you, Marty, for this fantastic, uh, presentation and uh and if i could uh, i just wanted to before we close uh, i do have a talk i'm giving on wednesday i have it in the the chat if you haven't lo uh, logged it out um captured it it's uh the political economy of climate change i think you might find it uh fun and informative very good thank you marie thank you good night